Okay, we're about ready to dig into report from Iron Mountain. This is going to be a lot of, of fun, at least for me anyway. I enjoy these books. Okay, starting with the foreword. John Doe, as I will call him in this book for reasons that will be made clear, is a professor at a large university in the Middle West. His field is one of the social sciences but I will not identify him beyond this. He telephoned me one evening last winter, quite unexpectedly. We had not been in touch for several years. He was in New York for a few days, he said, and there was something important he wanted to discuss with me. He wouldn't say what it was. We met for lunch the next day at a midtown restaurant. He was obviously disturbed. He made small talk for half an hour, which was quite out of character, and I didn't press him. Then, apropos of nothing, he mentioned a dispute between a writer and a prominent political family that had been in the headlines. What, he wanted to know, were my views on freedom of information. How would I qualify them, and so on. My answers were not memorable, but they seemed to satisfy him. Then, quite abruptly, he began to tell me the following story. Early in August of 1963, he said, he found a message on his desk that a Mrs. Potts had called him from Washington. When he returned the call, a man answered immediately and told Doe, among other things, that he had been selected to serve on a commission of the highest importance. Its objective was to determine accurately and realistically the nature of the problems that would confront the United States if and when a condition of permanent peace should arrive, and to draft a program for dealing with this contingency. The man described the unique procedures that were to govern the commission's work and that were expected to extend its scope far beyond that of any previous examination of these problems. Considering that the caller did not precisely identify either himself or his agency, his persuasiveness must have been of a truly remarkable order. Doe entertained no serious doubts of the bona fides of the project, however, chiefly because of his previous experience with the excessive secrecy that often surrounds quasi-governmental activities. In addition, the man at the other end of the line demonstrated an impressively complete and surprisingly detailed knowledge of Doe's work and personal life. He also mentioned the names of others who were to serve with the group. Most of them were known to Doe by reputation. Doe agreed to take the assignment. He felt that he had no real choice in the matter, and to appear the second Saturday following it at Iron Mountain, New York. An airline ticket arrived in his mail the next morning. The cloak and dagger tone of this convocation was further enhanced by the meeting place itself. Iron Mountain, located near the town of Hudson, is like something out of Ian Fleming or E. Phillips Oppenheim. It is an underground nuclear hideout for hundreds of large American corporations. Most of them use it as an emergency storage vault for important documents, but a number of them maintain substitute corporate headquarters as well, where essential personnel could presumably survive and continue to work after an attack. This latter group includes such firms as Standard Oil of New Jersey, Manufacturers Hanover Trust, and Shell. And I'm just going to interject a little comment there. Um, Iron Mountain does exist. Uh, when I went up to visit my dad in June, on the way back, um, on I-85, there was a tractor trailer uh, uh, for Iron Mountain documents. It was kind of interesting because, you know, you hear about it, you read about it, and then to actually you know, be side by side on the uh, on the throughway with um, an Iron Mountain uh, tractor trailer. That was kind of interesting. Anyway, getting back, I will leave most of the story of the operations of the special study group as the commission 
was formally called for Doe to tell it in his own words. Background information. At this point, it is necessary to say only that it met and worked regularly for over two and a half years, after which it produced a report. It was this document and what to do about it that Doe wanted to talk to me about. The report, he said, had been suppressed both by the study, the, excuse me, the special study group itself and by the government interagency committee to which it had been submitted. After months of agonizing, Doe had decided that he would no longer be party to keeping it secret. What he wanted from me was advice and assistance in having it published. He gave me his copy to read with the express understanding that if for any reason I were unwilling to become involved, I would say nothing about it to anyone else. I read the report that same night. I will pass over my own reactions to it except to say that the unwillingness of Doe's associates to publicize their findings became readily understandable. What had happened was that they had been so tenacious in their determination to deal comprehensively with the many problems of transition to peace that the original questions asked of them were never quite answered. Instead, this is what they concluded. Lasting peace, while not theoretically impossible, is probably unattainable. Even if it could be achieved, it would almost certainly not be in the best interests of a stable society to achieve it. That is the gist of what they say. Behind their qualified academic language runs this general argument. War fills certain functions essential to the stability of our society. Until other ways of filling them are developed, the war system must be maintained and improved in, in, in effectiveness. It is not surprising that the group in its letter of transmittal did not choose to justify its work to the lay reader, unexposed to the exigencies of higher political or military responsibility. Its report was addressed, deliberately, to unnamed government administrators of high rank. It assumed considerable political sophistication from this select audience. To the general reader, therefore, the substance of the document may be even more unsettling than its conclusions. And I need to stop it right there, and then we'll pick up in the next video.